but this is not so easy because since the enactment of the constitution so good evening students my name is vishal and i'm a faculty of plutus is <coughs> students i take law option paper for the purpose of upsc mains so in the law option paper as we all know that you upsc restrict itself to certain topics that have been part of the syllabus never have been the case that upsc have taken or <coughs> given in examination any question or any topic which is not the part of the syllabus so we here in plutus is we ensure that each and every topic that is included in the syllabus of upsc mains optional is covered in detail so once a topic is amendment of the constitution amendment of the constitution see generally under article 368 of the constitution we have the procedure for the amendment of the constitution but this is not so easy because since the enactment of the constitution uh, a question has come up repeatedly before the courts that whether the <coughs> parliament has an as an unfettered or unlimited power to amend the constitution including that of fundamental rights or whether is there any sort of limitation on the power of the uh, parliament to amend the constitution so now before going into the details of whether the parliament has unfettered or unlimited power for the purpose of amending the constitution we'll get into the detail why amendment of the constitution is important or why this provision for the amendment of the constitution was inserted in the constitution itself generally students we all know that constitution is the supreme law of any country it is a document that lays down the governance framework of any country it lays down in an express manner what are the rights that are available to the citizens of the country it lays down or it establishes various constitutional bodies it lays down their functions and as well as the limitations on the functions of these bodies generally as any other law see generally in jurisprudence we consider law as a document which is enacted to <coughs> for a, which is enacted for a certain purpose that means laws generally are enacted for the purpose of tackling a particular situation it could be the government it could be the case that the government has enacted a law to tackle a law and order situation it could be that the government has enacted a law to enable the government or to enable the government authorities to make provision for the welfare of the people of the country so laws generally are enacted uh, or in other words i'll just simplify the matter generally laws are enacted for the for the <coughs> purpose of fulfilling the needs of the time so that means laws when they were enacted they are relevant but with the passage of time generally what happens is the law sometimes become redundant irrelevant if they are not amended so like any other law constitution which is the supreme law of the land in jurisprudence we have a theory given by kelson in which he states that the laws are norms there are certain laws and the laws are nothing but norms and there is a hierarchy of norms and there is a superior there is a supreme norm from which all the other norms derive their authority and that supreme norm is called as grand norm grand norm the students who are from law background they must be aware of this term and the theory given by kelson so generally in india we have the constitution and below the constitution we have the laws enacted by the legislature and below them we have different rules which are framed by the governments to tackle certain situation or to take care of certain necessities or situations so generally what happens is so generally what happens is as constitution is also a law so it is important that the constitution should also evolve according to the needs of the time so when con the constitution was enacted in 1950 it was a wonderful piece of document it still is but since 
four years have elapsed till the passage of the constitution it is important that the constitution should keep pace with the time the social situations have changed in 74 years the economic situations have changed the political situations are changing every here and then so it is important that the constitution should also be flexible enough to accommodate the changes which happens in the society or in the political structure or in the economic systems so the constitution makers of india no doubt they were intelligent people they were legal luminaries most of them were legal luminaries so they knew that the provision for amendment of the constitution is important otherwise the constitution will become a redundant document which will not be able to fulfill the needs of the future times so that's why under article 368 itself they have made provisions for the amendment of the constitution now generally what happens is there are different modes of the amendment of the constitution certain modes are called as informal modes or rather informal methods and certain methods are called as formal methods formal methods now what do we understand by informal methods see informal methods means generally all of you must be conscious of that though you might not be able to articul articulate it properly but you must be conscious of that informal method means that generally it is done either by the courts through interpretations or it is done through adoption of conventions and usages so generally what happens is the judiciary the higher judiciary of the country what is the role of judiciary the prime role of or one of the foremost role of the judiciary is to interpret the constitution so generally we have seen uh, during our constitutional history that the judiciary has interpreted the constitution for the purpose of keeping it relevant or for the purpose of securing the fundamental rights of the people or for the purpose of <coughs> achieving at a harmonious construction between different provisions of the constitution that otherwise may seem contrary to each other so now what happens is ki the judiciary by interpreting the constitution it somehow amends the constitution but it generally does not changes the text of the constitution so when judiciary is interpreting article 21 so in the constitution it is written that nobody can be deprived of his life and liberty except by procedure established by law article 21 is saying nobody can be deprived of his life and liberty except by procedure established by law now it is the role of the judiciary to interpret article 21 so <coughs> the judiciary starting from menka gandhi versus union of india has given a very wide and elaborate interpretation to article 21 we have all seen that the judiciary has stated that the right to life does not only mean living like animals or just brute existence it means that living the life with dignity or living a life in such a manner which befits the life of a human being or right to life will include all the faculties all the facilities that promote the quality of life so now by given such a such a elaborative interpretation to article 21 what the judiciary has done is judiciary has somehow expanded the scope of article 21 without amending even a single alphabet in article 21 so generally what happens is the informal method of one of the most important informal method of amendment is by judicial interpretations but generally what happens is that the judiciary will only interpret the provisions of the constitution whenever there is a litigation before it whenever a litigation is filed by any party in very rare cases the judiciary takes the case suo moto takes cognizance of the case suo moto but generally the judiciary will <coughs> Uh, attempt to interpret the constitution when a question of law has been raised by any of the parties before the court so it is necessary that the parties raise the question of law before the judiciary before the judiciary even try to attempt the interpretation of the constitution 
now moving on to formal methods so one of the or we can say the formal method to amend the constitution is through article 368 i have told you that article 368 expressly provides the procedure to amend the constitution so the formal method of amending the constitution is by resorting to article 368 Article three sixty eight. Article three sixty eight itself provides three, or we can say two, not three. In totem, if we see, it is three. But generally, Article three sixty eight provide two methods of amendment of the constitution. Generally, there are three methods. Why am I saying only two methods under Article three sixty eight? Generally, what happens is there are certain there are certain transitional provisions in the constitution when i am saying transitional provisions that means those provisions were inserted in the constitution to care of to take care of the need of that time when the provisions were so inserted that means the constitution makers or after the amendment of the constitution the parliament knew that these are transitional provisions temporary provisions and according to or owing to the changes of the time or owing to the needs of changing time this provision need to be amended so these provisions can just be amended by the parliament by following an ordinary legislative process no what do we mean by ordinary legislative process it just means that parliament will pass a, pass a law by a simple majority it does not even have to pass the law by a special majority it will pass the law by a simple majority now what are those provisions that can be amended by the constitution just by uh, amended by the parliament sorry just by passing a ordinary law i'm giving a list of certain such provisions such as so now these are among such provisions that can be amended by the constitution amended by the parliament just by following an ordinary legislative process now when we talk of article 5 to 11 most of you must be aware of that these talks uh, these provision talk about the citizenship the provision of citizenship so in the constitution these provisions talk about how to or the criteria for attaining citizenship gaining citizenship of india and these articles were framed during the time of partition so it talks about who from india migrated to pakistan and then come back to india how will he be considered for citizenship or the people who belong to undivided india and they once were the part of or they once resided in the part that now became pakistan they came back to india before a certain date how the criteria or how will they be considered for the purpose of citizenship so generally it talks about certain provisions regarding citizenship so now the time or we can say the time for the purpose of which these provisions were made is over is over 75 years back 
or 76 years back so now for the purpose of making law regarding citizenship what the parliament will do is it will just pass a law so parliament has passed citizenship act then it has passed multiple amendments act uh, subsequent to the citizenship act and now these citizenship acts talks about the criteria for uh, gaining citizenship criteria for <coughs> gaining citizenship of a country the what are the methods would through which the citizenship of this country can be gained or how the citizenship can be terminated or revoked so now <coughs> in a similar manner article 124 clause 1 it just talks about that there would be a chief justice of india and and <coughs> there would be seven judges in the supreme court so now it was a it was a transit provision how because it talks about seven judges of the supreme court so when india was when the constitution of india was framed seven judges were enough but due to increase in the workload of judiciary due to increase in the population the litigation has increased with the increase in litigation obviously the appeals to the supreme court has increased so for the purpose of coping with such increased number of litigation the <coughs> constitution makers have very smartly inserted that the parliament can change the number of judges by making a law so the parliament can amend article 124 clause 1 just by passing an ordinary law and it can increase the required or sanction strength of the judges of the supreme court any time by passing an ordinary law Sim in a sim similar manner schedule 5 and 6 that relates to the administration of the scheduled areas and the scheduled tribes in the <coughs> scheduled areas and the <coughs> scheduled tribes in certain areas in the northeast right article 5 and 6 sorry schedule 5 and 6 and in the similar manner article 2 that talks about the admission of new states by the union so for example india in 1975 india admitted sikkim as a new state earlier sikkim was not the part of india so sikkim was admitted in the indian union and when a new state is formulated generally have what generally happens is uh, schedule one has to be amended because schedule one contains all the list of all the states and the territory of these states so obviously when a new state is created or when a new state is brought in the indian union our uh, schedule one has to be amended and when schedule one has to be amended it can be done by parliament just by passing a simple law there is no uh, need to pass an elab uh, there is no need to follow an elaborate procedure for the purpose of constitutional amendment so there are many such provisions in the constitution that can be amended by an ordinary legislative process so that means the parliament can just pass a law with simple majority in both the houses and the constitution will stand amended so these transitional provisions to cater to the need of amendment of such provisions a simple law will be passed by a simple majority in both the houses of parliament now under article 368 there are two methods of amendment of the constitution one is amendment by special majority and one is amendment by special majority plus there is a need of ratification by half of the states half of the states so there are certain provisions in the constitution that can be amended by special majority now what is that means what it means two by third of member present and voting plus majority of total membership of the house special majority means this majority plus ratification by half of the states that means <coughs> in india whatever the number of states we have because the number of states keep on 
changing so suppose we have 28 states so the ratification by 14 state will do the purpose so once an amendment to the constitution has to be passed by this method what we need is a special majority consisting of two by third of members of the houses of the parliament present and voting plus there is an additional requirement of majority of total membership of the house and in the second case special majority plus ratification by half of the seats so why are we uh, why do we have two such provisions why can't we just have a sim uh, simple special majority not simple why can't we just have a special majority to amend all the cons provisions of the constitution the answer lies here generally as i've told you all the provisions of the constitution does not hold does not hold uh, a same value of significance certain provisions or we can say in case of these provisions in which the procedure to amend them are is quite different or quite difficult not different difficult so we have the special majority plus ratification by half of the states these provisions are provisions which are related to the federal structure of the country federal structure of the country these are the provisions which are related to the federal structure of the country so these provisions are generally known by the expression entrenched provisions entrenched provisions so the provisions which directly relate to the federal structure of the country that means the relationship between the union and the states the division of authority between the union and the states so these provisions are known as federal so these are provisions are known as entrenched provision that means now why do the constitution makers have made amendment of these provisions difficult because we all know that the parliament is amended by uh, the constitution is amended by the parliament so now any party who has requisite number of seats in the both houses of parliament that party can amend the constitution and especially these provisions which are called as intense provision and as this provision relate to the federal structure of the country and division of power between the union and the states so a large party or a strong party having a large majority in the parliament can just amend the uh, can just amend these provisions and which can result in changing of the federal structure of the constitution or in other words which can result in usurpation or adhigrahan hindi mein bolte hain adhigrahan adhigrahan of the powers of the states by the union so as to dissuade the union from taking away the powers of the state without the consent of state these provisions have been inserted so if any of the federal provision any of the provision related to the federal structure of the country has to be amended at least ratification by half of the states is required i'll give you an example of these provisions it is mentioned in article 368 itself first of all to amend article 368 itself it requires this majority right then extent of executive power of the union and the state that is article 73 and 164 right then seventh schedule then manner of election of the president so now all of these provisions they are related to the federal structure because three article 368 it provides for a difficult provision procedure to amend those provisions that are related to federal structure so if article 368 was so easy to amend then the par any strong part in the parliament would have amended article 368 itself and it would remain it would have removed the requirement for taking the ratification of half of the states so just to dissuade that article to amend article 368 itself ratification by the half of the states is required seven schedule seven schedule of the constitution consists of the list three list union state and concurrent list and these lists provide for the leg the provide for the matters on which the union the state and the union and state concurrently can make laws so our seven schedule provide for the legislative competence of the union or the state on different matters election of the president generally who elects the president it is an there is an electoral college consisting of 
the members of the par- elected members of the parliament and elected members of the state legislative assembly that means state also have the role to uh, elect the president so the manner of election of the president cannot be amended by the parliament without taking ratification by half of the states and in the same way allotment of the seats to the states in the rajya sabha that also cannot be amended by the parliament without taking ratification by half of the states so just to protect the federal structure of the country and so as to ensure that the powers of the state government under the constitution is not taken away by the union government unilaterally without consulting the states these provisions the entrenched provisions or the provision related to the federal structure of the country has to be amended by the parliament by taking ratification of at least half of the states and as soon as the ratification of half of the states is achieved or <coughs> received the these provisions can be amended by the parliament right and all the other provisions which are not covered under this third method or the first method that we have discussed that can be amended by two third of the membership of uh, two thirds of the member present and voting plus majority of total members of the house so even the fundamental rights can be amended by this method but now the question here is can the parliament amend even amend the fundamental rights or does the power limit even has the power to amend fundamental rights now we have discussed the need for amendment we have discussed the procedure for amendment we have discussed the method for amendment and now we'll discuss the major question power of the parliament to amend the constitution power of the parliament to amend the constitution or justifiability of the amendment of the constitution generally what happened was as soon as i'll give you a background or i'll give you a brief background as soon as the constitution was enacted so now the constitution was enacted and under the constitution we have part 3 part 3 talks about various rights that have been provided to the individuals by the constitution in part 3 we had a right called as right to property under article 19 19 clause 1 sub clause f and under article 31 so now when the government of india in 1951 came into power it resorted to zamindari reforms now zamindari reforms mean means what the section of land ownership in this country was such that a lot of people or the majority a huge majority of the people in this country were landless and the few people were holding vast tracts of land so now to take away the land from people who have enormous lands and redistribute that land to the people who does not have land zamindari reforms were initiated now the biggest problem or the biggest obstruction with the zamindari reforms were right to property because as soon as the government was taking away the rights from zamindar these zamindars approached the supreme court saying that the government is attacking our right to property now the first amendment came in 1951 itself the parliament or the constitution was enacted in 1950 the first amendment came itself in 1951 among other things it provided for insertion of 31a and 31b in the constitution 31a and 31b in the constitution 31a talks about taking away of estates simple meaning property immovable property by the government and 31b talks about that whenever it established ninth schedule whenever the parliament places any law in the ninth schedule whenever the parliament by amendment places a law in the ninth schedule that law will be immune from challenge on the grounds of 
violation of fundamental rights violation of fundamental rights that means any law which has been inserted in the ninth schedule by the constitution that law will not be challenged that it is violating any of the fundamental rights mentioned under article or ancient mentioned under part 3 of the constitution now this amendment was challenged we have a case of shankri prasad versus union of india very important case shankri prasad versus union of india 1951 shankri prasad versus union of india 1951 now in this law in this case sorry in this case the question before the supreme court was whether the parliament has the power to take away fundamental rights or not whether the parliament has the power by constitutional amendment to amend fundamental rights or not now the question was decided by the supreme court in such a manner because article 13 talks that any law that takes away any of the fundamental rights is void so now the question here was ki whether a constitutional amendment can be called as a law because if it is called as a law that mean it if it comes under the ambit of article 13 uh, and ambit of law then by the virtue of article 13 if it tries to take away any of the fundamental rights it will become void try to understand if the constitutional amendment if it is considered as a law because it is passed by the parliament general laws are passed by the parliament uh, constitutional amendments are also passed by the parliament now the question here is if constitutional amendment is itself called as a law under article 13 that means an article 13 says law cannot violate fundamental right so if constitutional amendment is a law by the if uh, under the ambit of article 13 so it will be void if it takes away any of the fundamental rights of the <coughs> sorry constitution the court stated that the parliament while passing a general law is exercising its legislative power and the parliament while passing a constitutional amendment is passing or ex exercising its constituent power so these are two different powers so while passing an constitutional amendment it is exercising its constituent power so that means the law that is passed by the parliament or the, the constitutional amendment that is passed by the parliament will not be considered as law will not be considered as law so now when the parliament has the power to pass a constitutional amendment that constitutional amendment will not be considered as a law because article 13 does not talks about law including in itself constitutional amendment it talks about law ordinance by rule regulation it article 13 in article 13 law means any ordinance any by rule any regulation passed by the either the parliament or by uh, executive but it does not expressly states that the law in itself include constitutional amendment so when article 13 itself says that the constitutional amendment is not a law so that means the <coughs> constituent amendment constitutional amendment is not a law and if it is not a law so it can take away fundamental rights and it will not be considered void under article 13 so now the <coughs> supreme court stated that for the purpose of passing a general law the parliament is exercising its legislative power but by for the purpose of enacting a constitutional amendment it is exercising its constituent power so when it is exercising its constituent power even if it takes away any of the fundamental right the constitutional amendment will not be held as invalid under article 13 so that means the parliament has the power to amend any part of the constitution including fundamental rights so now shankri prasad versus union of india has laid down this jurisprudence this jurisprudence went forward 
and it was substantiated by another case Sajjan Singh versus state of Rajasthan Sajjan Singh versus state of Rajasthan 1965 in it the 17th amendment was challenged again under 17th amendment certain laws were inserted in 9th schedule right so again the right to property was under challenge because the 17th amendment was taking away the right to property again the court stated that Sajjan Singh in Sajjan Singh versus state of Rajasthan the court stated that the constitutional amendment is not law is not a law by the virtue of article 13 the parliament is amending the constitution or it is passing a constitutional amendment by exercising its constituent power by exercising its constituent power so that means if it is exercising its constituent power so the law passed by it does not fall within the ambit of article 13 thus the constitutional amendment if it even even if it takes away fundamental rights it will not be considered as invalid but there were certain judges that did not concur with this opinion majority stated yes the parliament has a, uh, under its constituent power the power to amend any part of the constitution including fundamental rights but there were certain judges justice justice mukherjee who were who did not concur with this line of argument they stated no that the fundamental rights have been given a very high status and accord by the constitution itself so the parliament cannot just take away fundamental rights because they are they are natural rights that give meaning to the life of individuals so the parliament cannot just take away the fundamental rights just by passing a constitutional amendment but since the, the judgment or the opinion that was delivered by these two judges justice mukherjee and one more judge it was a minority opinion so the judgment has to be by majority so <coughs> the earlier judgment that is sankri prasad was substantiated now what happened is again the case before the court came ic golaknath versus state of punjab versus state of punjab 1967 this was a case in which the court supreme court overturned its earlier judgment the court stated no the court stated that the fundamental rights they are a part of natural rights they are natural rights and they cannot just by passing a constitutional amendment take be taken away by the parliament they stated that <coughs> there are certain provisions in the constitution and just see the line of reasoning of the judges in ic golaknath case they stated there are certain provisions in the constitution which are less significant than fundamental rights and which can be <coughs> which has to be amended by the parliament by taking ratification by half of the states i have told you those provisions the court stated if these provisions which are less important than fundamental rights if this has to be amended by the parliament by taking ratification of half of the states then why the fundamental rights which are so important which forms the backbone of individual liberty can be amended by the parliament just by passing a constitutional amendment only by the parliament not even without not even by taking the concurrence or ratification of the states the part the court stated there are certain provisions which are of less significance that fundamental rights but they can be amended just by uh, they can be amended they has to be amended by the parliament by following a special majority rule plus ratification by half of the states and fundamental rights which are so important they can just be amended by the parliament itself there is no requirement of ratification by the states 
the court stated this cannot be the case then one very wonderful line of reasoning which looked then that it is wonderful the court stated article 368 only contain procedure for amendment procedure for amendment of the constitution it said it only contain the procedure now if article 368 only contain the procedure where is the power of the parliament to amend it stated the power of the parliament comes from article 248 that is the residuary power that is the residuary power that means the parliament is amending the constitution by through its residuary power generally the residuary power that means there are union list state list and concurrent list right so the union the parliament can make law on union list as well as the concurrent list the state can make law on the state list as well as the concurrent list so suppose there is any matter which is not mentioned in any of this list so if any law has to be passed in reg with regard to this matter only the parliament can pass because the parliament has the residuary power of legislation under article 248 as well as under uh, entry 97 list 1 that is beyond our uh, that is the beyond the scope of our study for today the parliament said the court stated that the residuary powers are given under article 248 so if the parliament is amending the constitution it is doing it by the virtue of residuary power so if it is exercising the residuary power it means it is passing a law by is its legislative powers or by resorting to its legislative powers so it say when the parliament is passing a law by resorting to its legislative powers that means the law that is passed that means the constitutional amendment would be a law under article 13 and once it becomes a law under article 13 that means it cannot take away any of the fundamental rights this was the reasoning which was given by the courts it stated that by parliament by passing a constitutional amendment it is passing the constitutional amendment by resorting to its power under article 248 and it is resorting it is <coughs> by passing a law under article 248 is exercising its ordinary legislative power that means the power to pass law that means constitutional amendment is a law and if it is a law so under article 13 it cannot take away fundamental rights so the court took away the power of the parliament to amend any fundamental right by this reasoning right now the parliament was also very shrewd there is always a tussle between the parliament and the judiciary the judiciary tried to restrict the scope of the uh, legislative competence of the parliament the parliament by passing constitutional amendments it tried to take away or it tried to agree again what the judiciary through judgments have taken away from it now the parliament passed 24th amendment and 25th amendment after Golaknath case I will not get into the details of this amendment but the general thing is it inserted it inserted certain provisions in article 13 and article 368 it stated in article 368 inserted a provision that nothing in the article 368 would be <coughs> would seem to affect article 13 and it stated that under article 13 no amendment by the way of article 368 will be considered as a law it stated under article 13 that any constitutional amendment under article 368 is not a law as under article 13 and under article 368 it inserted that nothing in article 368 will impact article 13 now what happened was there were many more things uh, i will not discuss that because the class will become lengthy what happened was the court in sorry the <coughs> parliament also passed 29th amendment act and by that it put kerala land reforms act in ninth schedule and now what happened was kerala 
the government of Kerala, it passed an order, it passed a law through which it tried to take away the lands of the religious denominations above a certain limit. Now there was a case of Adhanir Mutt, Keshwanand Bharti, he was the uh, uh, he was a sant or we can say head of Adhanir Mutt. And when the state of Kerala tried to take away the land of Adhanir Mutt, Keshwanand Bharti filed a case before the court that it is taking away my right to property. Now, going by these chain of events, a very famous case of Keshwanand Bharti versus Union of India came. Versus Union of India, 1973 came. And this, the court gave a fantastic judgment. The court said that the parliament has the power to amend the constitution. The power is derived from Article 368. It stated that the power is not derived from Article 248. It stated that Article 368 contains the power to amend the constitution. That means again, it took one line of reasoning of Shankri Prasad. It stated, yes, the parliament has constituent powers and by exercising its constituent powers, it can amend any part of the constitution. Now, secondly, including the fundamental rights, including fundamental rights. Secondly, it stated, however, however, the power to the power under Article 368 is to amend the Constitution. Now, amend means just bringing in a change, a minor change in the Constitution. So, the power of amendment cannot in itself include the power to change the entire structure or basic structure of the Constitution. It stated that the power to amend mean means bringing in some minor and necessary changes in the Constitution. It cannot be so interpreted so as to include the power to completely change the constitution itself or to destroy the constitution itself. So, it stated yes, the parliament does have the power to amend the constitution, but amend means amendment or to bring in changes. It does not means to destroy the basic structure of the constitution or to take away the entire constitution. So, now with this, the court came with the doctrine of basic structure. Doctrine of basic structure. It stated there are certain provisions in the constitution which are fundamental, so fundamental that they cannot be taken away. And if they are amended, that means it will amount to destroying the very spirit of the constitution itself. So, these provisions are called as the basic or these provisions are called as forming the basic structure of the constitution and the power of the parliament to amend the constitution does not mean to amend those provisions that are the part of basic structure. And what are those provisions? The supremacy of the constitution, independence of judiciary, federal structure, democratic structure, secularism, all these are part of basic structure. Even including there are certain fundamental rights which also form the part of basic structure such as right to equality. However, Article 31 right to property was not considered to be part of basic structure. So, it can be amended by the constitution. So, I hope I have tried to explain this lengthy topic in a brief as brief uh, man, as brief a manner which can be possible. So, I hope you have enjoyed the video and the video was informatic as well as uh, full of insights for you. So, for more of such videos, please stay tuned with Plutus IS. Thank you.